Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, my instinct when I'm doing this is to project, but anybody who was part of our webinar series last year will notice we're in a different location. We built a uh, studio for our videos, so this is where we're going to be doing it. We're going to be your water, your breakfast, whatever else uh, you need on the line side. All right, welcome back. So, um, as always, uh, we're going to start with a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, firstly, uh, the uh, connectivity uh, and the volume should be a lot better. The sound should be a lot better. Anybody who thought there was a problem with the audio earlier, uh, Brandy mutes me. Uh, I'm not staying on my notes. Uh, I have a tendency to go well off pissed. Um, and uh, Randy has learned to just mute. Uh, but me being who I am, was standing here, so there was nothing wrong with the audio, I was just being a moron. Uh, <laughs> so we'll establish that. Um, we're going to go through a whole bunch. We're, we're talking about spring and the garden waking up, what we can do to help it. Um, it again, as always, if there are any uh problems. Uh, with comprehension, if I'm not explaining something or I'm going too fast, please interrupt. Um, if you have a question about your garden or something I've talked about here, let's save those till the end, just so that we have a better flow. I cannot be trusted to go off like in the middle of a walk. So. Good? Okay. So the first thing I'll, uh, I'll address is our new uh, area. Uh, it feels very weird. And uh, for the last three years, we've been doing these now. Yeah. For the last three years, I've been downstairs and I've had to yell. Uh, we didn't have mics. There was uh, ambient noise behind me, people pushing cars, customers, uh, birds. Um, but it feels really weird. It kind of feels too quiet. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hope everybody enjoys the new look. Uh, I've got my fancy little table. I, and please don't, don't think that just because we're in this brand new area with a brand new table and whatnot, that I won't make a mess. I will not hesitate to throw soil everywhere and cause absolute chaos. I just don't care. So, um, it's Saturday morning. We've all woken up somewhat and saw coffee. And speaking of that, how does a garden wake up? So, as always, my notes here are just my PowerPoint. Uh, this is primarily, so again, I don't go off track and I can stay on point. But right now, uh, we're looking outside. So, from my backyard, the part of it, uh, it faces north, and the house shades uh, a lot of the, the, the lawn area out. I still has snow on it. But my front yard, uh, even with the snow we recently got, it's already pretty clear. And before we got this latest snowfall, uh, my daylight is already up about this, uh, maybe maybe four inches, five inches. And how is it doing? So the first one is the light. 
So uh, the Earth is rotated now. Uh, we're into spring. We're getting more light coming in. Um, the people in Australia are now in winter, which I don't even feel bad about saying because their winter is still better than our spring. So I don't even feel bad about calling them out on that. But with more light, light is allowing any buds there to photosynthesize, but we also have warmth. The warmth is melting all of that snow ice. It's receding, and a lot of it is soaking into the ground. So now we have moisture feeding the plants. The plants are starting to pick up because the roots are thawed. They're drinking. They're touching up the, uh, the, 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 the stems and the uh, foliage, which is photosynthesizing because of the uh, increased light. And as it's warming up, I, 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 so this morning I left my house at uh, 5.45 and the birds were already singing. Um, so there's increased activity where we're seeing birds, we're seeing bugs, um, but there's also actually the plant in the soil. Um, the bacteria are pouring out, the microbes, the nematodes, everything is starting to come alive, the earthworms, and things are moving. So we now have this life happening, the nutrients and the food and the energy is all happening. Much as we get invigorated in the spring by this, so much is happening in our garden. So. What can we? <laughs> well, I don't have enough room to place it nicely on the table, so we're just going to establish how to clean things off here. That's all. Um, so, what can we expect to see? Perennial shoots. I've already talked about that. Budding out. I've already seen trees uh, budding out. I actually saw um, my first perennial flower uh, last week on the most hill, the prairie crocus, which not prairie, but it was a primary focus. It sounds better than a hill anemone because nobody would know what I'm talking about. But I saw um, my first primary focus open and that made me very happy. Increased bird activity, bugs, good and bad, um, are going to be out there. A lot of greening up. Again, that's primarily the moisture soaking into them, big open areas absorbing all of that sun, the bulbs breaking the surface. Uh, the other day, uh, I can't remember where I was now. Um, but I was walking and somebody had a slope, a pretty steep slope, very well drained, facing full south. And they already had just tiny, tiny little tulips peeking up, tiny. I mean, they, they literally just broke. Um, we're also going to see winter debris, uh, leaves, branches, garbage. And we're going to see that horrible, flat, compacted, dull soil. So what do we need to know? What can we do? It is too early to plant. I've brought some plants to make it look pretty. It is way too early to be putting our plants out. Um, this coffee is going to be real hot. Mm -hmm. That's why I also brought water, but I won't drink the water. That's just for lux. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we can't plant, but what can we do? So we can amend and cultivate our soil. Uh, we can start watering if needed. Again, areas on slopes that are facing south. Uh, moisture is leaving. Moisture is first and foremost on everybody's mind this year. I have done a ton of interviews, global, CPC, CTV, uh, all kinds of places. Uh, everybody asking about moisture. Uh, we can look at fertilizing if we have activity, removing that debris that I just talked about, planning and, uh, and prep. Uh, what we can do to be ready. I'm not talking about prepping the salt for planting. I'm talking about our tools and our pots and that kind of thing and being bird green. Uh, we want those birds in our garden, so let's figure out how to get them. So we're going to start amending and cultivating the soil. Uh, the reason I'm starting there is not in any sense of priority. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, I love it. It's to me, that freshening up of the soil, is, um, it, it's not a labor-intensive task, I don't find. So I find it uh, it's a nice introduction. And when you turn around and all of that soil is turned and it's gone from that not very nice kind of just basic brown to a fluff of black earth, it really inspires me. Like I look at that and it's like, it's like when, when life is hectic and you haven't been able to clean your house, all you've been doing is kind of running the dishwasher and putting a couple of things away and there's clutter everywhere. And you do that huge sweep through your house and then you stop and you look and you go, oh my God, now I can go take a nap on my couch. That's how this makes me feel. So a soil amendment is a 
essentially any material that we're adding to the soil to improve its physical properties, such as water retention. A uh, healthy soil is very important for water conservation. Permeability, which is drainage at the same time, because even though we control the water, we cannot control what falls from the sky, so we don't want a heavy soil that's going to flood. Um, water infiltration, drainage, aeration, and structure. That's basically what an amendment does. Uh, I'll talk about uh, what amendments are very soon, or the, or the various ones. And cultivating breaks up that crusty soil surface. So our, our soil is being compacted in the snow. Maybe we blocked it. Uh, the ice, the moisture pulling down, soaking in, holds the aggregates down together. By breaking that up, we allow a gas exchange. We allow an air exchange. We mix those nutrients together like a mixed and cold. Um, we're, we're basically invigorating it. Um, and gas exchange and freeing of nutrients is so, so important um, to the roots. Um, so really quickly, this isn't in the PowerPoint, but I'm just gonna, and we're, we're, we're gonna do a webinar all about soil, uh, exactly what soil is, why it's healthy, why it's so important for water conservation, but really quickly, and I'm so excited for that. It's next week, there you go. <laughs> but you know what that's why we have an event page exactly. yeah so uh, everybody can pre-plan clearly neither you nor i have read it <laughs> uh but that's why it's there um so amendments some of my favorite amendments i brought some up i just brought up little bags earthworm casting my plants my garden you know, i can't go wrong with them uh cocoa coir i've got mineral um, graceful mineral or volcanic uh, rock mineral you can use, uh, compost, manure, uh, peat moss. There's so much stuff we can add to our soils. Um, and we're going to cover that in a lot more detail because I know that can be confusing when people come and they go, oh my God, I got all of this in my soil. Absolutely no, you don't. Some people have a preference for one thing. Uh, some people go, well, uh, I need a really, really rich soil because of uh, this plant, but I, I, I need a, a stronger soil for this plant. So there's a number of different things we're looking at. But how do we amend? So first thing, get rid of the debris, okay? Uh, we don't want to be turning in any garbage, um, the leaves, that kind of stuff. We, you don't want them in your heads. Uh, get them out, uh, get them into the compost bin. Turn the soil uh, to break the compaction. And for that, I just got a little hand cultivator, but I've got other ones behind me. All you want to do is just dig it, just rip, and that soil is going to start breaking, work down, uh, add your amendments at the same time. Okay? So when you're breaking that soil tension, before I even do that, clean the debris first, and then I scatter uh, my compost and my cocoa coir and my worm castings all over the soil. Then I cultivate. So as I'm breaking the crust, I'm working the new stuff straight into it. Um, there's no need to go deeper than this. So, so that's about two and a half inches. Uh, maybe, maybe if you really want to angle it, go the full length, go to maybe uh, four inches. That's it. Most of the plants that we put in, most of the new plants are about this size. Uh, some of the annuals, I know I've got some back here. Please help me fall. Please help me fall. Ha <laughs> ha! I found that perfectly. So tiny. If you're working the soil to this depth, the roots aren't going to get there and it's going to pull down anyway. So only work those amendments in. You don't have to uh, go crazy with shovels and garden forks and amend this. It, you can, absolutely. It is not going to hurt. The amount of help it's doing is minimal, but if you're all like, nope, I, how I like to do my soil, I get a workout, I enjoy it, I want that full healthy soil as deep as I can go, go for it. Absolutely. But going in a little bit lighter, I, I, what I like to do is I like to amend my soil two or three times over the year, other than just once in the spring going ridiculously deep. So I constantly am adding amendments. Um, I think we figure that out as we go. Turn the soil carefully around existing plants. So if you have a perennial coming up like this, you might not want to put your cultivator in there and start going at it. Start to go hard, and then as you get closer, it's trickier. It just breaks that crust. The amendments will soak in on their own. Uh, we're trying to help the garden. We're not trying to uh, tear up the roots. So there is a principle about if a plant isn't performing, about uh, making the roots stress,
but then we pick up the phone. Put, why don't I call someone real quick? We're going to move on. Okay. Now, breathing, breaking. Designation. It's because of their ability to provide, because of their ability to propagate. So when the spring hits, uh, they're straight out of the gate, and they get all of that energy, and they're already going. They're already going full bore uh, into the season. So you can normally spot them right away uh, as you're turning the soil, as you're amending it, uh, and you can get rid of them as you're uh, cultivating, especially if you're using garden hose like this. I, I, I honestly cultivators and garden hose are my favorite tool. Get that under the uh, get that under the weed and slice and smash the light like I almost just did. Um, I guess this is what I need to talk about because this is normally I've got about twenty feet apart from me. Uh, and hack those weeds out. Um, and you can do that as you go, uh, and you're saving the job, much like cultivating and amending at the same time, weed at the same time. Not all weeds are your enemy, okay? Uh, I don't like weeds in my uh, veggie gardens um, because I want all of those nutrients um, going to my veggies. I don't want the weeds to steal any moisture uh, and whatnot. But if you have a naturalized area, leave the weeds. They are natural. Uh, weeds in the lawn, it doesn't bother me at all. I actually like it. It's a place for my pollinators. Those weeds, they're the first to green up. They're normally the first with activity, which means the pollinators see them. The pollinators are coming to my garden, uh, which means that they're going to find my tomato plants. They know that my garden is a reliable food source. So, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the term weed unless we understand what weed means. So weed... Plants are designated that because of their ability to survive, but weed essentially means an unwanted plant. We don't want it in our garden. I know some people that would consider a 40-foot blue spruce a weed. It's just a bit harder to get rid of than your, uh, say, average dandelion. If you're raking, uh, if your grass is nice and dry, you're on a slope, you're facing south, and you're raking, Go gentle. All you're trying to do right now is get rid of the debris and the grass will be lying flat. Much much like the soil compacts, the grass is being pushed down. It's it crumpled up on itself. All we're trying to do when we rake is we're just trying to lift the grass. We just want it to come up. Um, airflow, the blades will be able to photosynthesize better. Now, this year, so my next point on here, and it's it's absolutely true for normal years. Later on, in a couple of weeks from now, we can go out and rake again, and we can really rake hard and dethatch. We might not be doing that this year. Thatch is very important. So thatch is uh, all of the organic matter, the grass clippings from when you cut the lawn last year, uh, bits of branches and leaves and whatever, what have you. And it's formed almost a mulch. So if this is our soil level and this is our blade of grass, thatch sits up here. Now, a lot of times we want to get rid of that in the spring. Uh, we want the fertilizer to not have to filter through anything to get straight down to the roots. We want the rain to get to the roots. We want the sun uh, to hit and dry it out to stop any kind of uh, fungus from happening. But this year, we actually might want that thatch to act as a mulch, uh, to hold moisture in there and insulate that ground. So be real careful uh, dethatching. I don't recommend power dethatching. I never do. Uh, but this year, I won't be dethatching any of my lawn. It'll get uh, its spring rake for um, cleaning and lifting, and that'll be it. Remember that our roots are tender. The grass is uh, still wet. Even if it feels dry to walk on, an inch, two inches below that soil uh, can be wet. It can still be frozen. And those roots are just waking up. And I see people every year ripping the grass with a hard metal rake first thing in the spring and you look at that pile and it's you know 70 percent thatch and 30 percent green grass and then they're out there seeding and they wonder why their lawn uh, is always a little patchy or not as healthy as it could be because you're being too vigorous i don't want to be woken up by somebody grabbing my hair and vigorously brushing it but if somebody were to gently rub my head, not somebody randomly just comes into my room and rubs my head to wake me up. I'm primarily talking about Jenny. Um, but 
I wouldn't want that to wake me up. That would hurt and it wouldn't do me much good. A gentle wake up is always better. And it's the same for the garden. We want to wake it up gently. Uh, the amendments are like our coffee. You know, we like our coffee in the morning. So that's what we're looking at. Any garbage, get rid of. Um, there's, it's just garbage. Put it in the recycling or the garbage as appropriate. Um, and uh, any of the any big debris. Sorry, I, I, I skipped that part. I was already past that in my brain. Uh, any big debris, so uh, a large clump of wet leaves, uh, large branches, things that aren't going to um, really provide any overwintering uh, habitat for the bugs, we can get rid of that. However, any so if you're like me, uh, every year you're going to leave a pile in your garden uh, for your bugs to overwinter, for your beneficial bugs. Um, I don't clean that up at all. Uh, normally my grass under that, by the time I get around to cleaning it up, is that horrible sickly yellow looking grass it comes back like that but for me it's more important uh, that I have a place for those bugs I couldn't tell you the last time I used a chemical spray in my garden uh, I've used fungicides I'm talking um, pesticides because I try to ensure that I have centipedes and spiders um, sand beetles ladybirds um, and I see them all the time in the spring I could probably clean up my yard in about an hour but I spend at least two and a half hours and the other hour and a half is me taking pictures of all the beneficial bugs. Uh, <laughs> how can you not? When you're cleaning up and you're like, oh, lady bro. Yeah. Have you ever been raking vigorously and you rake a pile and just as it's flipping over, you see a ladybird and you're like, oh no. Oh and, yeah, on yeah. worms too. Yeah. Oh. I, I once uh, used um, insecticidal soap because we had a ton of aphids and I accidentally sprayed a ladybird. <gasps> Yeah, and I took it over to the hose and I washed it off. Oh my gosh. And I put it back out in the sunshine. It seemed fine. Um, it was quite happy. It, it happens. That's why I'm, I'm not a huge fan of chemical sprays because you can hit everything. But leave those piles. The beneficial bugs love them. Do the bad bugs? Sure they do. But the beneficial bugs, um, think of them like teenagers. They wake up hungry. Okay? I wake up and I wake up grouchy and in need of a coffee. Uh, my teenager wakes up and he's like, eat, eat. <laughs> That's his goal. He's like a beneficial bug. Well, not really because he eats my food, not his food, but <laughs> I digress. Um, and yeah, some of the ladybirds, we all love them. They have great PR. I don't know who did the PR on them, but great job, whatever firm. That firm needs to get hired by spiders and centipedes because they have very bad PR. Um, I hear all the time people coming and going, oh, how do I kill my centipedes? Oh, I got too many spiders. We don't want to kill them. Uh, we want them in the garden. So, watering. Uh, and I know that always sounds silly uh, whenever I talk about it at this time of year. Uh, maybe not this year. Again, this year is a, how am I doing for time? Oh, doing great. Yeah. Um, this year, everybody is very sensitive about watering. Um, however, uh, and I'll speak for Calgary because I don't check the weather everywhere. Um, we just got a lot of snow uh, in the last four days. So our ground is pretty wet. Uh, yeah, some areas, they're okay. Um, but next week, I think starting tomorrow, it's meant to be 7 degrees in full sun. And then it's like 10 degrees, 12 degrees, 12 degrees. But all full sun, no moisture. Now these plants are just waking up. Uh, those roots are actively looking uh, for water. They need to photosynthesize because they are aggressively growing to get up right now so they can get the energy for their bloom so that they can survive for their fruit, whatever might be happening. Now is when we need to keep an eye on that. And if you notice that ground is dry, get out there and get watering. It's not gonna hurt. Uh, and we will discuss watering techniques and properly watering and how to conserve water. Again, having a healthy soil, that's a great place to start. Cold ground isn't wet ground. I see people go out, uh, I've seen this numerous times, where people go out and they'll lie their hand on the ground and they're like, oh, it feels wet. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is. It just might be cold. Maybe there's a thin layer of uh, frost um, on it and you've touched that, the frost has melted on your hand uh, and caused moisture. The moment that sun comes up and it goes to two, three, five degrees, 
that is going to evaporate. It's really not going to soak in, and it's not going to soak into any depth for the roots. So a cold ground isn't a wet ground. Just try and remember that when, when you're checking. If, if need be, do the finger check uh, and stick your finger into the soil and see uh, that. Oh, that was some soil. That was cool. <laughs> um, check it that way. Essential watering, things that you really have to keep an eye out. So your lawn is probably going to be fine. It's a huge catch basin of uh, moisture. Um, they're normally, normally good at taking care of themselves. Budding trees, uh, especially uh, any kind of new tree. Maybe you planted a tree last year or it's a small tree. 40 foot trees, they're going to be fine. They've got their own water source. Your smaller trees you might want to look at. Hedges uh, as well. Bulbs. Tulips, daffodils, crocus, any of them that are coming up, uh, make sure they've got moisture. You don't want to stunt them. You don't want them going uh, wilting or into drought mode. You want them actively growing. Or perennials, uh, they're coming out of the ground. Uh, if that ground is dry, you might want to give them a drink. Now, eventually, if you, again, same with your trees, if it's a really, really healthy, mature perennial, especially a drought tolerant one, so I'll talk about my yard again, my day lilies. Um, they're going to be fine. It's uh, my more gentle perennials. Uh, I got some poppies. I got some peonies. Um, they all uh, are going to want to drink. So I always keep an eye on uh, the moisture around them. Another question uh, we frequently get at this time of year is do we fertilize? Amending your soil is not fertilizing. Fertilizing. I don't know why I just went, yeah, I don't know why I went to be like an English country gardener there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to do some fertilizing. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, but these, even, even this glacial rock dust, okay, what, what do we look for on a fertilizer? MPK. Those three numbers on the front, this does not have them. Your amendments are not fertilizers. They may add uh, micronutrients, but they're adding, again, they're adding structure to the soil. Uh, water retention. Uh, they're bringing in other things. They are not bringing in fertilizer. And I did not grab a fertilizer because I forgot about this page when I was putting it together. <laughs> um, but we all, I, I think we all know what a fertilizer is. So, um, yes, you can start fertilizing now. Uh, use the correct fertilizer if you can. Uh, so lawn on lawn, um, trees and shrubs on your trees and shrubs. Uh, if all you have is all purpose, use it on everything. That's what its name is for. Follow the manufacturer's directions. Uh, every year we get people who go, oh, if, um, you know, uh, one tablespoon is good, five tablespoons must be awesome. Exact opposite. Uh, dial your fertilizer back. Don't pump it up. Only fertilize during active growth. So my daylilies in my front, like I said, are this big. Yes, they can be fertilized. They are ready to go. They're growing. They're going to pull that nutrient up. Uh, in my backyard, where I have shade and I still have some snow in places, no fertilizer. All that's going to happen is the fertilizer and the salts are going to coat the roots. The roots can't drink it, and it may inhibit their ability to pull up water. So only fertilize during active growth. Active growth, however, can also be bud break. So you... You look at a tree and you go, well, it's not actively growing. I'm not watching a new branch get bigger every day, but you're watching those buds swell and it went from being brown and now you can start seeing green in between it and you go, oh, that's ready to pop. That can be fertilized as well. So I guess activity, if there's activity happening in the garden, you can start fertilizing. Slow release is always good for this time of year. It's activated by heat and moisture. Uh, so we don't have to worry too much about that. And then we can always swap when we've done our planting to our water solubles. And less is more. Like I said, uh, dial your fertilizer back. Um, there's no need to be going out there uh, fertilizing every single week and doubling what the manufacturers said. Okay, our trees and shrubs. Prune as needed. So we can start shaping them. Uh, we can snip back things leggy. Sometimes we don't notice how it looks in the fall. We're cleaning up. We're not really looking. In the spring, we go, oh, that's a weird branch. Uh, we can take that off. Don't over prune. Uh, you can always snip something off later. You can't, well, I mean, you can graft it back on, but it's not ideal. Um, and I've seen that happen so many times where people look at a plant and they go, oh, that needs pruning. And they get very eager and they step back and it looks like they uh, pruned it with a lawnmower. And remember the five D's. Dead, diseased, 
damaged, dangerous, and desirable. And I'm going to go through those really quick. Dead, anything that is completely dead, uh, it's barren, uh, the wood inside is brown, there's no leaves on it, but don't take them all off. As I have always said since yesterday, leave a few for the birds. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is we are never, ever, ever so good that we can't learn. And uh, yesterday uh, for an upcoming podcast, Brandy and I sat down with our good friend Myrna, who is a bird expert, Myrna Pierman. She's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And Myrna is a huge advocate of dead branches and how important they are to birds. And that blew me away because my perspective uh, as a gardener has always been like, I've got birds in my garden. I'm not using any chemical sprays. They seem fine, but I clean my plants up accordingly. So dead branches, you better believe they're coming off. Myrna is like, oh, I've got a half dead tree in my property. I love it. The birds are always in it. And I was like, get out of here. And we had a, we had a really interesting discussion about that. So as I have always said since yesterday, leave a few <laughs> dead branches, especially ones that stick out from the tree. The birds like to sit at the end because uh, like Myrna said, it's called hawking. So they sit and they look for insects and they look for other food sources or water, but they're safe from the predators and there's no leaves to obscure their view. So branches that are sticking out that are dead, they might not be aesthetic, but they are absolutely essential to diversity in the garden. Uh, Diseased, we all know uh, what we're talking about there. Black knot or uh, if as the uh, leaves are coming out, um, we see a very active disease, we can nip them off. Again, not over pruning. Damaged. A branch might be hanging down. It's not dead. There is growth there, but it's not doing good. We can tidy that up. Dangerous, ask for help. If it's dangerous, a small branch at eye level, uh, yeah, you can snip that off. But if it's a large branch and it's now overhanging your greenhouse, you put in a greenhouse last year and you're like, ooh, if that comes down, I'm in trouble. Ask for help. Get an arborist. Uh, don't do it alone. Uh, the risk of damage to yourself and the tree is huge. We've all seen YouTube videos of people cutting a tree and tree kicking back or cutting a branch and the whole branch comes down. Not good, not worth it. Uh, ask for, if if I had to pick uh, between doing that, asking for help or letting it crush my greenhouse, I'm asking for help, letting it crush my greenhouse. The third option and only, only, only in the rarest cases would I ever do it by myself. I have a lot of experience, I've done it, and I still wouldn't be 100% comfortable, so ask for help. Desirable, pruning for desirable sounds weird. Why are we cutting it off if we want it? That is actually desirable is the desired shape. Maybe we want to cut it a little bit lower so it bushes out. Maybe we want to thin it a bit so we can see through because there's a nice view, Um, whatever we're looking at. But desirable is pruning for shape. So that's our trees and shrubs. Planning and prep. Check and clean our garden tools. Um, I put my tools away. I'm pretty careful putting them away in the fall. I I scrape all the soil off. I hose them down. I make sure they're good. But every once in a while, something can fall off a shelf. I might not notice. Uh, It might be sitting in a puddle all winter, and now I've got some rust happening here. I have to clean that up. Maybe over the winter, on my wood. Oh, 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 now that wood handle tool. This wood handle tool, maybe it dried out and there's a big split in it, I'm gonna use it and it's gonna snap. Uh, So just give your tools a once over, you're gonna just put them down, give them a pressure test, uh, make sure they're fine, make sure you're not gonna get splinters. If the wood's a little rough, you can always hockey tape it, uh, something like that, but give your tools a once over. It's always fun bringing them out, do a tool inventory, see what you've got, check and clean your pots. A lot of us, uh, yeah, we may buy uh, seedling pots every year, but we're not buying brand new, huge ceramic pots every year. Check them. Uh, I've seen this happen before uh, where uh, I bring out a pot uh, from the garage, my own, or when I was landscaping somebody else's, and it's totally fine. I put it down, I plant it, I go to lift it up. Now the weight of the soil and the plants, there was a hairline fracture and it crumbles and all the plants fall out and I've got a mess and I have to fix it and I'm down a pot. So give it a check, give it a once over, uh, clean it. Um, You don't have to sterilize it. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, But get any residual soil off it, just freshen it up. Uh, Plan the garden layout. Uh, We have a ton of books. I grabbed three from three different people because I think we carry books from four or five different vendors now. Uh, There's always books, there's Google, come in and talk to us. 
uh, listen to our podcast, watch webinars, the ton of resources to help you plan your garden. And remember your successes and your not so successes. I don't want to use the word failure because that's terrible in a garden. Uh, but maybe you planted something last year and you were like, ooh, that did not get enough sunlight or it got too much sunlight. Um, or I put a hanging basket up, it looked great, but then as the plants trailed down, I kept walking into them. Um, think of those things, change as needed, change accordingly, uh, and have fun with it. So there's our tools. Uh, I already talked about that. Make sure they're clean. Um, good tip. This is uh, moving forward. Obviously, I'm jumping straight to the fall now. I mean, we literally just started spring, so what better time uh, than to talk about autumn? But a good thing you can do, we used to do it when I was uh, doing it professionally, is coat your tools with oil. Uh, not motor oil, uh, but coat your tools with uh, oil. Horticultural oil works great. Uh, and it helps keep them rust free, it helps keep any sediment or salt off them uh, over the season. But make sure your tools are clean. You can even give them a sharpen. If you've got a, a whetstone or a grinder, you can even put a fresh blade on them, uh, get you really going in the season, check the working condition of your tools. Okay, pots and planters. Making sure your pots are clean. Um, it looks nice, it's a nice aesthetic. It can be hard to clean them once they're planted. But especially if you had uh, any kind of disease or bugs last year, uh, you're gonna really, really wanna clean those pots. Uh, I use hydrogen peroxide. Um, I upcycle a lot of pots, uh, I believe in it. Like if I plant this perennial, you better believe I'm keeping this pot. It'll come in handy for a transplanted spider plant in my house. Uh, it'll come in handy uh, for a seedling uh, that I'm growing. Maybe uh, I've got a pepper. I can't get it into the garden. It needs to go into a pot. Now I've got a pot. Um, always make sure, though, if you're going to do it, wash them and then sterilize them. Just a rag, uh, some hydrogen peroxide, and clean them. Most growers' pots and outdoor pots will have drain holes in the bottom. Uh, make sure that uh, they have no obstruction. Uh, maybe uh, some soil got in there, it's dried out, it's turned into that, like, you know when soil dries out and it turns like a rock? Yeah. Yeah, so, and sometimes we don't notice, it, it looks like the inside of the pot. So make sure your drain holes, don't just assume they are. Um, you can always take, you know, a little spike, a gar I've got gardening spike, something, uh, a knife handle and just pop up and pop it out. Make sure they're clear, we don't want pots flooding. Make sure they're undamaged. Check for cracks. I already explained why. Uh, that's a nightmare. Ensure they haven't buckled. Um, I use some of my composite pots, uh, fiberglass pots, over the winter uh, for uh, winter uh, ornamentation. Now, uh, the moisture that was in there, the, the melting snow and whatnot, uh, the freeze-thaw effect, uh, you can put it out in the summer, and now suddenly you've got a wobbly pot. Not the end of the world, but if it's not stable and the wind catches it, it may much more easier tip over. If somebody knocks it, it's more susceptible to go over. So keep an eye out for anything um, that is buckled and check the base for structure. Uh, a lot of times on our ceramic pots, we can get cracks running right around the base where it's formed. That's often a weak joint and that's where moisture sits. We dried it out, but it's ceramic, it's porous. Moisture got in. Doesn't look like it's cracked, but if you look on the inside, give it a little tap, see if anything's flaking off. Um, again, you plant, you pick it up, and the bottom stays on the ground, and the top comes up, and it's not a great feeling. It feels so nice to not yell. My throat isn't sore. <laughs> it, it still feels weird. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to lie. It feels weird. Um, planning all layout. Okay. This is one of the most fun things, and we're going to talk uh, later on uh, in another webinar uh, about gardening with kids. Uh, and this is a great, kids love to draw, they love to sketch, they love to have fun, uh, be it on uh, their iPad, on the computer, uh, whatever, it's a piece of paper, crayons, it does not matter. Um, but start planning the garden. You don't have to draw it to scale, um, you, you don't have to be Van Gogh. Um, you just have to have fun just to give an idea. And, and the most important thing about this is when you do it, bring it with you to the garden center. Because I know people who do it and they're very happy and they go, okay, I have room for four watermelons. That's where my watermelons are going to go. And then they come to the garden center and they're like, was it four or six? 
I should buy eight. And then they get home, oh, maybe that's just me. <laughs> Probably most people would be like, two. But anyway, um, when you get home, you realize you either have bought too many or not bought enough. So bring this with you and you can sketch it, you can use Excel, that's always a fun program, uh, Word document, uh, you can use emojis. Didn't you find an app that allows you to... Uh, um... Yeah, I think, I think there was an app. There's, well, there's there no must app. be, yeah. If, that... there, if, I, if there's not, I mean, there has to be. Yeah, and there must be more than one. Yeah, and, and also, we were talking about on the podcast, remember we were talking about themed gardens? Like, yep. like moon gardens or yep. herb gardens with like a specific theme. Angry gardens. Angry gardens. Yep. <laughs> All your and negative energy gardens. Exactly. Gardens. Negative, negative energy garden yeah. sounds way better. What did yeah. we call it? A hate garden? <laughs> Negative energy sounds way better. That was on a podcast episode. Brandy had an amazing idea. We'll talk on that later, but I'll, I'll tune into that podcast. It was a lot of fun. Um, when you're doing it, use the stats. So if you've planted seeds, look, make sure and go, okay, that's how big it's going to get. That's how wide it's going to get. I know I have room. Uh, when you get a plant, most new plants are going to have a label. Uh, the label, um, I don't know, can that be read clearly there, Brandy? Or do I need to bring it a bit closer? Oh, I, the part the, the part I need doesn't have soil on it. I'll come around to here. So most plant labels will have height and spread of uh, perennials. That's also true of annuals and whatnot. Annuals I'm a lot more unforgiving about. Uh, I've talked about it before. I will, if you've ever seen me plant a planter, uh, you know how those annuals are like, oh, they should be 15 centimeters apart. I'm like, 15 millimeters? <laughs> um, be creative. Have fun. Um, again, we're going to remember our successes and our not so successes the next year. Try something new. You never know. I stuck a sunflower seed in a pot one time and I got a sunflower. Um, try it, test it, see what you can do. Have fun. Um, that's another great reason to bring kids in because kids will absolutely not care. They will put anything anywhere. Uh, some of it isn't going to work. You're like, I cannot grow a tomato in my chimney. Uh, but other times you're like, why don't we try that? And they'll have some reason. They'll be like, oh, I want to grow this because uh, the squirrels really like that area and I want to give them strawberries. Give the squirrels some strawberries. Who cares? Uh, adjust from previous years. Play around. If you've got the room, rotate your crops. That's always a good idea uh, for the health of the soil. Um, any bad bugs or diseases you have. Now, a lot of us do not have the room. Crop rotation is more of an agricultural thing. It does have a place in uh, the garden. But a lot of us, we're very set. We, we have a small area for our veggie bed and we've got our perennial beds cut and then we have our lawn. We don't have the ability to just be swapping crops. Like we might only have that one section for sun. Um, but if you can, if you do have the room, it's, uh, it's advisable to do it. And when you're, when you're planning, like I said, I can't recommend this enough. These books, um, a lot of these, so uh, Lone Pine Publishers is up in Edmonton. Uh, the Prairie Gardeners, I believe, they're right here in Calgary, aren't they? Yeah, they're going to be on the podcast yep. too. Yeah, we're going to be talking to them soon. And we already talked to ABCBs. Yeah, Elise is fantastic. Yep. Um, so these, a lot of these are local. Elise is an incredible beekeeper, a good friend of ours. Uh, we carry all of these books. They're worthwhile checking. And this is Gardening for Bees. So um, it's going to tell you, um, it's not going to tell you you can't garden. It's going to say, oh, you want to put in flowers? These ones are great for bringing bees in. Uh, and it's going to allow you to have all of the flowers and the veggies and the perennials and everything you want and be bee friendly. Uh, and if the bees are liking it, the butterflies are going to like it. If they both like it, there's a good chance the birds are liking it. So everything, again, diversity is key. Okay, attracting birds. Uh, we spoke about that. Um, three most essential things uh, for any animal, uh, really anything that lives, uh, is looking for three things. It's looking for food, okay? So I've got uh, sunflower chips and a sunflower chip feeder. Uh, that's essential. It's looking for shelter. Now, we have trees and shrubs. They work amazing, but we also have gourds. And this, not this one specifically, it would be in a museum. But these are the earliest birdhouses that we've ever found. Uh, Myrna, again, was telling us... Um, the uh, Native North Americans uh, were doing this uh, for the purple, uh, purple swallows 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Incredible. 
Um, so this is just a hollowed out gourd. Uh, great idea, but the birds are looking for shelter. So lots of trees, shrubs, we've got our food, and they're looking for water. A little bird bath, little dish like this. You put some rocks in this as well. It's perfect for bees. A, a running water, like a small fountain uh, to attract them in uh, is huge. But if you have food, shelter, and water, there's no guarantee, no guarantee we're dealing with a wild animal um but you will significantly increase your chances if you offer them what they're looking for and let's quickly talk about bugs um both both types of bugs good and bad they're inevitable they are absolutely inevitable you will see them in your garden spider mites aphids ladybirds centipedes they're gonna be there they're great indicators of health um so if you if you see some aphids, but you're not seeing a lot of aphid damage, you see ladybirds, but you only see one or two, your garden is probably nicely balanced. It's where it should be. You don't need to interfere. If you are seeing hundreds of ladybirds in your garden and you didn't release them, you might want to investigate a little closer. If you are seeing significant aphid damage across all of your crops, you might have to start taking some action on that. So bugs are a great way to tell us what to look for. No need to panic. I tell this story a lot. A few years ago, I took a picture of a, uh, a flower because it was spring and I was happy. And I zoomed in and I spotted an aphid in the picture. Uh, all I did was go, oh, I'm going to have to keep an eye out. I did. There was no aphid damage. Uh, I had, like I said, I have a lot of ladybirds in my garden. I have a lot of bugs in my garden. Uh, those aphids, sure, they need to eat too. Uh, there's a lot of birds. Birds like pecking off aphids. So... Uh, I have a lot happening in my garden. That aphid never caused me any trouble. I didn't cause it any trouble. I just let it go. So there's no need to panic. Observing is key. So when you go out and you're harvesting or you're deadheading or you're fertilizing or you're cultivating, keep an eye on your plants. Just give them a cursory check through. You don't have to be out there for an hour on every plant with a magnifying glass. Look, is there a sign of damage? Is there something you're not sure about? Are you seeing a bug? Keep an eye out for that. Certain bugs can indicate other issues. The two uh, most common ones that I think people can uh, understand here, spiders. I got a lot of people who go, I have a ton of spiders, I need to kill them all. The spiders are only there because there's a food source. Spiders are a predator bug. So what are they eating? Look in their webs. If you're terrified, hey, no, no shame. I am not a huge fan of it. I'm a huge fan of spiders from a very big distance. Um, I love what they do. I think they are a fascinating fascinating creature if there was one uh, right there my appropriate reaction would be to scream like a seven-year-old and run out the room <laughs> uh, I'm not a huge fan of spiders being close to me if you can get up close to the web see what bugs are in there uh, maybe it'll tell you oh I have a problem I need to address it and it could be something as awesome as mosquitoes in which case the spiders are doing you a solid uh, the other one is wasps. A lot of people go, oh, there's a ton of wasps uh, in my aspens. I need to kill the wasps. You really don't. Uh, you need to um, either deal with the aphids that are pulling all of the sugar out of the aspens, and that's what the wasps are going for, or the aspen is leaking sap. It might not be very healthy. That's what the wasps are going for. You might need to look at an arborist. So there are options, and we've got a ton of wicked things. These we brought in a couple of years ago, and they have been incredible. And can we see that clearly, Brandy? Yes, I love it. Yeah, the praying mantis, or as some people call it, the Tenodera aridifolia sinensis. Woo! It's also written on the back. Yeah, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've got a, uh, this one is great for kids. It's a praying mantis egg in its own little chamber. So they're a lot of fun. Wasps are incredibly territorial. Hang up a waspinator. Right now, the wasps see it, they think it's another nest, they go elsewhere, and these work amazing. Uh, if you don't want to get one of these, you don't want I think they're like 10 bucks or something, I, they're really not expensive. Or you can take um, a balloon or one of those really cheap uh, dollar store soccer balls or beach balls, put it in a brown paper bag and hang that up. Uh, there's your life hack. You don't have to get one of those, but they work amazing. The thing I like about the waspinator more than the brown paper bag method the waspinator can take being uh, rained on. Brown paper bags cannot. They'll deteriorate. Then you've got a mess. Uh, the waspinator, I, I have neighbors. They never take theirs in. It's out all winter. Uh, and they leave it and it works a treat. Uh, bugs are easily treatable through biological. 
uh, controls or picking them off by hand. There are chemical sprays. I don't like them. I really don't. You'll hit gut bugs too. Uh, sometimes you go out and your plants are just crawling with aphids. You can't even see the stems. Yeah, you're probably going to need to do a chemical treatment. You see five, six, 20 aphids. I wouldn't stress it. If you start seeing damage, if they're killing your plant, a chemical spray, if not, go biological. We sell live ladybirds, we sell praying mantis, we sell nematodes. We have a bio liner company we work with that can get you any kind of a biological. Whatever pest you've got, they've got a bug that'll take care of it. So that's our bugs. I want to thank you all for being here. New setup, a new way of presenting. We're not going through event guides. We had problems last year, uh, just real quick. Uh, we didn't have a problem with Event Guide. Uh, event Guide, uh, was it Event Guide? Event Bright. Yeah. Event Bright uh, worked really good for us. Um, but we had people that were trying to listen to the webinars that were finding it a barrier to entry. They were having difficulty logging in or it wasn't accepting them. Uh, and that frustrates Brandy and I because uh, we really we really appreciate our listeners. Um, and if people can't get in, um, what's the point? So uh, Brandy um, figured out a way, uh, credit where credit is due. Um, without Brandy, none of this would be happening. And she figured out how to live stream this and go on all of our platforms uh, and really drop all of those barriers for entry. So a huge thank you to you as always, Brandy. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if there's any questions, we now have the time. We do have questions. All right. What do you want to know uh, from Colin? What do you want to talk about for spring gardening? If you have a comment, maybe something you're excited about, let us know. Yeah, sure. It doesn't have to be a question. It can just be like, I love spring. Be like, I love Colin's hair. <laughs> I don't know. But like, <laughs> I'm sure all the comments would be like, get a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a question from Instagram from Beautiful Skin and Mind and Hair and says, please suggest your favorite and well behaved perennials for full sun. <laughs> I'm sorry, you lost me a beautiful hair. <laughs> Woo, um, that's <laughs> well behaved, well -behaved. <laughs> love it. Um, can't go wrong with uh, Echinacea um, or Rebecca. Uh, Echinacea, purple coneflower, I think we all know what it looks like, it's on every single vitamin, not with Echinacea. Um, and Rebecca is the yellow, black-eyed Susan is often the common name of that one. Uh, the reason I like them, the reason I say they're well behaved, extremely resistant to disease, drought tolerant to an extent, amazingly strong stem, like you see, you see them stand up in the wind, you don't have to stake them. Uh, and they put out a real great flower and the two of them play so well together because you have uh, the purple uh, petals of the echinacea and that central uh, yellow part. And then you've got the yellow petals, which pick up the yellow in the echinacea on the Rebecca and that jet black center. Uh, I love Monada. Uh, bee balm, that's another one. That can be susceptible to um, powdery mildew, though. Um, Bleeding Heart, uh, a favorite of mine. That's actually uh, why I grabbed it. I love this one too, Brennera. Uh, this one is uh, a lot of fun. Doesn't get too big. Doesn't aggressively spread, but it will spread a little bit. But I really, really, I got to bring this closer just because I think it's <laughs> fascinating. I love the leaves. It's not even, I mean, the flowers, come on. Um, I mean, somebody would probably call that Hungarian purple. I call it blue. <laughs> but again, sorry, we're throwing back to podcasts. So if you haven't seen the podcasts, these aren't inside jokes. They're just from the podcast. But I love that deep vein. I love the silver. These look incredible in a full moon. Uh, that silver picks up that. Oh, they're outstanding. Um, sedum. Uh, there's one called Autumn Joy. Uh, you get the luck of a succulent, and then it puts out a bright red flower, almost like a uh, broccoli, uh, and that's great for uh, the fall. Uh, those are some of the big hitters. Those are some of my personal favorites, and they're all well-behaved. Bee balm, amazing for the bees, amazing for the honeybirds. We can eat the flowers. They're a sweet, peppery flavor, a little bit susceptible to powdery mildew. It's a fair payoff, I think. What's the, what was that, Monera? Uh, uh, Monada, M-O-N-A-D-A. ADA. ADA. Common name is Bee Bomb. Oh, same thing. Okay, yeah. Got it. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Same one. <laughs> I'm just going to pop it in the chat. All right. Okay. Let's see here. Ooh, okay. Uh, okay. From Instagram, uh, JF Kennedy 3377. Any plant suggestions to attract bees to 
to your yard. Oh, bee bomb. yep, bee bomb, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any any perennial flowering tree or shrub is a great idea. Sunflowers, uh, late stage, I know, um, but you can get all different sizes of sunflowers. Uh, the smaller ones bloom quicker than the big ones. Incredibly important to the bee, especially the native bees. They go wild for sunflowers. They are uh, fantastic. As long as it has a bloom, you can't, excuse me, you can't go wrong. Veggies are another amazing one. Uh, zucchini, uh, squash, they do amazing because they put out such a huge flower um, that they see it and then they'll come and hit up your tomatoes and your peppers. Uh, annuals, uh, another important one. Annuals don't have a ton of pollen, but what they don't have is a ton of pollen in the flower. Oh, I shouldn't say annuals like that very generically. A lot of them, like your pansies and whatnot, they make up for in just volume. Uh, the bee isn't flying too far. It's literally going... Bzz, 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 bzz. Um, it was like back, you know, what, 10, 15 years ago where there was like three Starbucks on one block. Uh, that's what annuals are like for, uh, for the bees. Honestly, if it's in bloom, you can't go wrong. If you want a bit more, uh, there's, uh, again, this book from Elise um, about how it works. And I, I haven't looked through it in a while. Last time I read it was when she was here. Um, but she talks about continuous blooms. Variety is the spice of life. Um, so that, uh, having a ton of different variety. Another amazing one. I've talked about them a lot in this, uh, in this episode, but... Uh, I have to do it, such an important perennial, daylilies. Once a daylily is mature, the amount, they, daylilies are the ones where you see the bees are one of the ones, where you see the bees go into the flower, because it's like a trumpet flower, and they come out and they're just bright yellow or orange. And you're like, you know they've got a big smile on their face, they're like, I'm the most awesome bee, and then they fly away. <laughs> so really, anything that has very prolific blooms, you can't go wrong for the bees. Um, but diversity, because... You see some people and uh, they may not plant anything uh, for early spring or uh, they pull out and, and okay, here's a freebie. Here's a freebie. Uh, I'd argue uh, the most important uh, perennial we can have in our garden for bees, not all you're gonna wanna hear this, is the dandelion, okay? It is probably the most important perennial. Uh, the amount of food that they have, how soon they open, and how hardy they are. They are absolutely a uh, critical food source uh, for the pollinators. Uh, and they are a perennial. So, haha, <laughs> kind of threw that one in there to be a jerk. But it is actually also true and important. Um, also, for that episode that we did with Elise, I'm going to link the podcast. Perfect. It was, yep. it, was, it was really good if you're interested in bees. Well, this is so awesome. That last year, there was a storm uh, in the summer, and she called me, and she was like, do you guys still have annuals? And I was like, yeah, of course. Uh, I was like, we don't have much. Like, we've got slim pickings. I think it was pushing into July. And she's like, the storm took out a bunch of my annuals. Uh, the poor little bees are going to need more food. And she just came and bought what... So she wasn't buying because she was like, oh, that looks nice, and that looks nice. <laughs> she's just buying in volume because she wanted to give food to the bees. What the heck is wrong with that? I, I have never once seen annuals put together and being like, mm, that's ugly. It's like, it's colorful, it's bright, it's friendly. Go for it. Yeah, and she was talking about, remember the bullseye? Yep. So like bees see differently than we yep. do. And so if your flower has like a bright center in it, then it's almost like a bullseye yep. for the bee. It's and some of, the, some of the patterns on the flowers are like landing, like yeah. arrows pointing oh, to it. She was amazing. Yeah, so her. cool. Okay, next question from Instagram. Uh, from... Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Dying, dying to try Madden no Ranch. So sorry. That's, um, any thoughts on Joe Pie Weed? I don't know what yeah, that is. Joe Pie Weed, it's a perennial. It's oh. fantastic. Love it. I love Joe Pie Weed. That's actually a great shout out. Um, I started using Joe Pie Weed a number of years ago now in Montreal. Um, it grows quite wild in Quebec. Uh, a lot of times in uh, irrigation ditches in uh, the country because they love the moisture. Uh, and those huge flowers they put out um, are critical for uh, native um, bees. I, and Joe Pieweed used to get a really bad rap. Joe Pieweed and Goldenrod used to get a really bad rap for allergies because they simply happen uh, around the same time as ragweed. And people would be like, I'm deathly allergic to it. And it's like, you're not. 
that's actually pretty like hyperallergenic. I mean, if you're allergic to pollen, sure, but it's the ragweed that is causing the problem. Joe Pieweed and Goldenrod, and they go great together. The bright gold of the Goldenrod, and then the pink floofy of the Joe Pieweed. Great combination, great suggestion. Or get a hold of us on our social. Okay. Or... <laughs> uh, sorry, there's that too. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's pretty much it. But let's kind of go into some of the events we're coming up. We have Earth Day next week. Okay, wicked. So we're gonna be talking about Earth conscious things. And uh, yeah, that one's uh, that one's important. Um... We have the following up that with that we will be talking more about pollinators. Perfect. On April 27th, and then we'll go into perennials. My favorite, um, always my favorite one. Yeah, annuals and planters in time for Mother's Day. And then we hit the May long weekend. We'll be talking about getting out in the garden. Uh, and then we'll follow up with organic gardening. Well, then we'll have veggies and herbs, uh, moving into gardening with kids. And then we'll kind of round things off with the webinar series with working with nature and garden burnout. So it's a really Perfect. nice, diverse collection. And I, I'm just going to quickly say right now, so gardening with kids is at the end. If you have kids... Uh, get them in the garden. Uh, absolutely. Um, believe me, there is nothing they can do that can't be fixed. They can absolutely make mistakes, but that is how they learn. Kids are tactile and they want to see it. Get seed in their hand and get them feeding chickadees. Uh, get them out there smelling flowers. Um, get them. I bought this for myself, but since we're mentioning it, get them something like this, a flower press. Uh, you can press leaves and foliage and flowers, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, get them to get their hands dirty. Start microgreens. It is so much fun uh, gardening with kids. It's actually why I started doing things like webinars. I liked gardening because it was peace and quiet and kids would come and talk to me. And I used to love talking to them about earthworms. Some of them had never held a bug. Um, because that, that was just the way, it, and I'm like, well, I'm going to put a bug in your hand, yeah. and away we go. I remember one kid was like, oh my God, look at that spider. Can we pick it up? And I was like, mm-mm, not that one. <laughs> Let's find a different bug. So, but yeah, that it, we will talk more on that. As you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about that. I, I want to see everybody gardening. There is no barrier to entry for gardening. We can always figure it out. It doesn't matter about age or ability or what have you we can we can figure out a way that you can mess around with plants so i'm so glad we have some new uh, fun webinars this year i'm excited for them we do and that actually wraps us up we actually had um, somebody on on uh, youtube just say uh, michelle said thanks for this i'm going to check out the podcast and set a reminder to be back next saturday well then we'll set a reminder to be here next saturday michelle we look forward to seeing you <laughs> perfect that's it that wraps us up okay bye everyone have a great day Thank you.